Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are joining us across the world and across the Asia Society Global Network, through our centres uh, across the United States, across Asia, and now in Europe as well. What brings us together on this extraordinary occasion uh, is the tragedy which has befallen not just the people of Japan, but also uh, those who are friends of Japan around the world. And that has been the brutal assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, we have brought together this event today uh, with uh, many who have uh, worked with former Prime Minister uh, Abe in Japan, those of us who have engaged with him in various capacities over the years. Um, and we hope to use this uh, hour, which lies ahead of us, to reflect not just on Shinzo Abe the man, Shinzo Abe the Prime Minister, but also Shinzo Abe's legacy uh, for Japan, for the region and the world. As we begin, however, on this solemn occasion, uh, I might ask uh, each and every one of us uh, simply to be silent and to reflect uh, as we um, honour the memory of this extraordinary Japanese leader. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining those of us at the Asia Society uh, in those moments of silent reflection on the contributions of a great man. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by a number of uh, panelists from around the world. My name is Kevin Rudd. I'm the President and Global CEO of the Asia Society. And today I'm joining you from Sydney in Australia. Uh, where I am momentarily before returning to the United States where I normally work uh, next week. We're also joined, however, by a number of other speakers, and I would like to uh, briefly acknowledge um, their uh, status and their role and their capacity in which they join us. We're joined by Yoriko Kawaguchi, who served as the Minister for the Environment in Japan and subsequently as Foreign Minister of Japan. Um, she continues as special advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, between 2004 and 5. She's a former member of the Upper House of the Japanese Diet for the Liberal Democratic Party, of course, that being Prime Minister Abe's party. She's currently a visiting professor at uh, Musashino University, a fellow at Musashino Institute for Global Affairs, and an honorary researcher at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research. So we thank Yoriko for joining us today. We're also joined by Danny Russell, Vice President for International Policy and International Security and Diplomacy at the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. Danny was a former U.S. Foreign Service officer, culminating in his role as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs under President Obama. He also served as President Obama's Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, Danny is a fluent Japanese speaker and was also U.S. Consul General in Osaka, Kobe. Wendy Cutler will also be joining us. Wendy, Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute and the Managing Director of our office in Washington, D.C. Spent nearly three decades in the USTR, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, where she also served as Acting Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. And during her extensive career on trade policy and trade negotiations, she worked on a range of regional, bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations and initiatives involving Japan. And most, of course, uh, acutely, most recently, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And finally, we're joined um, from our Tokyo Centre as well by Takako Hikotani, recently joined at the Policy Institute as a fellow attached to the Asia Society Centre in Tokyo, Professor at Gaku Shulin uh, University International Centre, an adjunct senior research scholar at Columbia University, where she obtained her PhD. Uh, she's previously taught at Japan's National Defence Academy, the Ground and Air Defence Staff Colleges, and the National Institute for Defence Studies an expert on civil military relations, Japanese domestic politics and foreign policy. And one of her most recent books is entitled 
Trump's give to Japan time for Tokyo to invest in the liberal order. So let's bring our panellists together uh, for uh, this um, opening set of remarks uh, to um, uh, our gathering uh, around the world today. Let me begin by making just a few observations myself as a former Prime Minister and former Foreign Minister of Australia uh, in uh, my uh, reflections on Shinzo Abe himself. Our terms do not overlap all that much, uh, but I do remember the extraordinary uh, leadership uh, which he reflected uh, in the office of Prime Minister. Um, the most vivid reflection I have of uh, Shinzo Abe was, in fact, after I left office and I was asked to moderate a public session between uh, Shinzo Abe, the then Prime Minister of Japan, and Vladimir Putin, uh, President of the Russian Federation, in Vladivostok at the Far Eastern Economic Forum. And this was an extraordinary event because there I was in the middle of a conversation, myself having left office with these two heads of government, uh, as Shinzo Abe decided to take on this public forum uh, to use it as an opportunity to make a formal public pitch to President Putin to resolve once and for all the outstanding question of the disputed Northern Territories. That is, those territories to the north of Japan, those islands to north of Japan, which the Soviet Union had seized from Japan at the conclusion of the Second World War. I well remember uh, Shinzo Abe's uh, strong, eloquent, passionate, from the pulpit, uh, advocacy as to why Vladimir, as he referred to him in the public gathering, and he, uh, Shinzo, could not do this deal, uh, given that they were both leaders of their country and both determined to put to one side the, uh, the problems of history. What I admired most about uh, Shinzo Abe's performance that day was the sheer courage of it. He undertook that um, public advocacy and public request of Putin, not knowing what the answer would be. Putin's answer, as history records, was a very simple and cold net. No, he would not be doing such a deal on the Northern Territories and then return to Japanese sovereignty. But what I admired in the political leader that I saw in Shinzo Abe that day was someone who's prepared to take a risk in order to move the dial forward. And what I've observed with, with Shinzo Abe's performance as Prime Minister across those many years, 2006-07, and then, of course, in his second term, 2012, 13 to 2020, was again his preparedness to use his political capital to deploy it uh, in support of the major reforms to Japanese foreign policy, Japanese security policy, Japanese economic policy, and Japanese social policy in order to move the dial on Japan's place in the region and the world. A remarkable man not without controversy, but a truly remarkable man. On these personal reflections, perhaps I could now turn to uh, the former foreign minister uh, of Japan, uh, Yoriko Kawaguchi, to share with us her personal reflections, having worked with uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japanese politics. Yoko, some reflections from you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, for, I don't remember when I first met, but that was about 2000. And when I was foreign minister of Japan, he was deputy chief cabinet secretary under Prime Minister Koizumi. Um, and I was dealing with the abduction issue by North Korea of the Japanese uh, nationals. And he was, this was one of the issues that he was very, um, concerned with. He met with the, um, the family members of the abductees and pushing the issue forward. He is a very warm person. I have never seen him uh, raise his voice. Um, he remembers people and he has inf enough information to deal with each politician or non-politician Japanese citizens. Um, there are just many people who I think he has had a very good team around him who really admired him, who respected him, and who um, was, um, in a way, um, dependent on him, regarded him as a good leader. I think he was um, naturally born 
um, born to be a good political leader. Uh, he never, when he, you talk to him, uh, he never really um, made a wall between you and him. He, um, he comes down to you and he listens to you as long as you want to talk. Although I'm sure he was uh, bored or he was impatient inside himself. He never showed it. So that's why he, many people liked him. And if, when you talk of a good leader, you might think of a very strong person. Uh, yes, he was a strong person. As Kevin was just describing, he did not hesitate to raise issues, um, but, but he led the country, the Japanese people, very warmly in a way, in a very personally um, concerned manner to whatever issues that he had to deal with. He has two, I think he has two aspects. Uh, one is a, a reformist. He, he was willing to, and he, was, he wanted to bring in reform into the Japanese society. And he also is, um, was um, a nationalist in a way, but not narrow-minded nationalist, internationalist and idealist, believing in um, democracy, freedom, um, mm. rule of law. I, when I saw his picture on this screen just moments ago, I became very emotional. We still cannot get over um, what happens, ha happened three days, four days ago. Um, mm. I think it will take time for us to get over uh, whatever the implications that this incident um, brought us with. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Yoriko. Yours is a very human reflection, not just on um, uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, warmth, as you mentioned, that extraordinarily sensitive question of uh, dealing with ab those who've been abducted uh, from Japan by the North Koreans and dealing with individual families, but also the warmth which has been reflected in response to the Japanese people and public um, to um, uh, his uh, family and uh, those who are closest to him given the extraordinary tragedy of his death. Now, for those of us who have been elected political office before, like yourself and myself, it is a shock, a shock, when one of our colleagues, democratically elected, is, um, is uh, destroyed uh, by an assassin's bullet. It's an assault on all of us who are Democrats, all of us. So your reaction just now, as you've described it, to seeing the picture of this great man uh, now laid low by an assassin's bullet is an entirely human one. Tony Russell, um, you're a Japan expert. You've served in Japan. You're a professional uh, U.S. diplomat. Um, you've also worked in the Obama uh, White House administration in senior positions. Your reflections on uh, Shinzo Abe, the man. Thanks, Kevin. Well, I worked uh, with... Uh, Prime Minister Abe and his team uh, initially in his first term in 2006-07 when I was the Consul General in Osaka. Uh, but then, of course, beginning in December of 2012, when I was Obama's special assistant and Prime Minister Abe uh, took over in uh, Japan. And there were many, many meetings and many amazing adventures culminating in the joint trips of the two presidents first to Hiroshima and then to Pearl Harbor. But perhaps um, my claim to fame would be that I actually knew and worked with Abe Shinzo in 1985 when he was the uh, private secretary to his father, then foreign minister Abe Shintaro, and I was the staff assistant to then U.S. Ambassador Mike Mansfield. And as the two principal aides, we often spoke on the phone. We would meet uh, for ramen and uh, plan our boss's next meetings. And my claim to fame is that I uh, once invited Abe to an embassy uh, party uh, to which he brought his date, um, certain Miss Akie, 
who subsequently mm-hmm. became his wife. So I like to think that I may have uh, played a little <laughs> role in facilitating that, uh, that union. <laughs> Uh, Danny, um, if you knew the, the new Shinzo, uh, the young Shinzo Abe, I should say, in a way perhaps none of the rest of us did, and did he have uh, the uh, the gleam of uh, political leadership and ambition in his eye well and truly there? He had it in his DNA, Kevin. Uh, hmm. Abe Shinzo was truly uh, to the manner born. He was part of Japan's political aristocracy. Uh, his father, who ironically died at the same age as Abe Shinzo has, uh, died unexpectedly as well, be it of natural causes. And uh, so never fulfilled what seemed like his manifest destiny of becoming prime minister. Uh, Mm -hmm. Abe's grandfather was, of course, the famous prime minister post-war period. Uh, And there was never any doubt he inherited, virtually inherited his seat in uh, Yamaguchi Prefecture so the progression from the uh, assistant or the private secretary to one's politician father to being a politician in his own right was almost automatic. What I certainly never imagined was the uh, heights to which he would ascend, uh, the success that he would have within the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, uh, or the tremendous impact and influence that he would exert. That was uh, definitely not uh, visible uh, uh, at that time. Wendy Kapler, trade negotiator, lots of dealings with Japan, reflections which you have on either the prime minister uh, and his personal leadership style, uh, or more generally, and his contribution to Japanese um, public policy. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks. And, you know, when we talk about the Prime Minister Abe's legacy, I think we really need to include international trade as a a key component of that. I mean, what he did on TPP, you talk about taking a bold action in a country where free trade was, you know, not talked about and the domestic opposition he had to take on, particularly from his agriculture community. And he was able to pull this off. Um, to deal with his domestic politics and yet, um, you know, put together an incredible team, recognize he needed to bring his negotiating team into the Conte, into his office, because he knew the way that the, the Japanese had negotiated trade agreements to that date did not lead to favorable outcomes or comprehensive outcomes. So watching him and his team in action for me was an incredible honor And just eight weeks ago, when I was in Japan, I was honored to have a very small meeting with him. And I was always struck in all my dealings with him, but particularly eight weeks ago, how substantive he was. And what he wanted to talk about was, was there any chance, were there any circumstances under which I thought that the U.S. could return to CPTPP? And that's kind of the man that I kind of remember, a risk taker, a reformer, but just incredibly substantive. I think that's our collective reflection. I should remind our viewers that uh, Wendy was um, recently in Japan receiving from the government of Japan the Order of the Rising Sun. So uh, for her extraordinary contribution to trade policy, but also uh, the trade relationship between the United States and Japan. Thank you for those reflections, uh, Wendy. Uh, Takako, you've been on the ground in Tokyo watching Uh, the public's uh, reaction to this uh, violent act in uh, Japanese politics. Uh, Give us a sense of uh, how you think the people are handling uh, this, um, not just political tragedy, but personal tragedy for the um, Abe family. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Yes, I think it's been quite striking how um, the people have come out to the street. Um, There was a proceeding of motorcade uh, from his funeral to the LDP headquarters, to the Diet office and the prime minister's office. And it's not surprising that people working for government or people who work for him at the party will come out, but there's just so many people lining the streets. And not just that, but there was memorials set up, not at the um, site of the shooting, but also in places like his alma mater and also um, in his hometown, but also places that have some kind of relationship with Abe, um, Prime Minister Abe, like um, the Toyaku summit site, um, there was a memorial set up and people are bringing 
flowers there. So I think it's just that, and, and another thing that's striking is there's a lot of younger people. And I realized that for the younger generation, he's basically the only leader that they remember quite well. And that's gonna have a certain impact. And that's something that um, I've been really thinking about. And, it's, and especially since it came right before the election, and it came in a form of such gun violence that we don't really see in Japan. I think this is going to be a really memorable moment for people here that they'll look back to and think about what they were doing on the day that Prime Minister Abe was um, killed. Thank you. Let's go to the um, policy legacy, therefore, of um, Shinzo Abe. Uh, mention has just been made before by uh, Wendy of what he did in terms of trade policy. So let's start there. Um, Yoriko, uh, Wendy quite rightly pointed to the fact that this was an extraordinary act of politics. Those of us who know your wonderful country really well know that free trade has not always necessarily been the friend of Japanese domestic politics. And therefore, for uh, Shinzo Abe uh, to take this idea of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then to sell it, first of all, to uh, the US administration and then sell it to other countries in the region, but most importantly, sell it to his own system, both the LDP and the much feared and revered MITI um, and within Japanese domestic political bureaucracy. How did he actually manage to pull this off? Uh, this is what I find quite remarkable as a 100% as a gaijin. I find this quite remarkable how he did it. I would like to um, say two things. One is that um, he has had, when he was prime minister, a very strong um, political capital to implement what he wanted to, to implement. Uh, as you said, and my second point is that uh, traditionally, Japan is an internationalist country. We do not have uh, resources other than human resources. So we needed to buy, purchase uh, materials and intermediate products and to sell. And we had, I remember the time when we had just so small foreign exchanges. People thought that um, unless we could trade, Japan would not really survive. What, so, but, but as you mentioned, that there is a strong group, agriculture group, and some, maybe a couple of others who are not for free trade. But overall, business circle included, we are for um, the international trade, free trade. So the key was to um, balance um, and also to um, that everyone is, we come to a solution that every sector is happy about. And he had a, that is where his political leadership was needed and worked. Because people after all thought that if that is the case, if he, he wants it this way, we would follow. I think it's the atmosphere he created. Thank you. Danny, you're a serious Japan expert. You know the country really well. Um, it must have been an enormous um, uh, kick in the stomach uh, when Trump uh, decided to walk away uh, from the, uh, the TPP. How do you think um, Shinzo Abe coped with that, um, given he'd expended so much domestic political capital, as Yoriko has just said, in advancing this as a uh, international um, trade policy initiative of the government of Japan, only to see uh, Japan's closest uh, ally slam the door shut. How did he cope with it? And then what did he do uh, in response to it? Um, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by this. Danny? Well, Wendy is the world's expert on TPP and CPTPP, so I'll just speak to the uh, the political and the strategic aspect of this, which is that for Shinzo Abe, as well as for Barack Obama, uh, TPP was every bit as much a uh, strategic 
uh, initiative as it was a trade initiative. And I think that the, uh, you know, the shiver of uh, fear that uh, Shinzo Abe felt when on his first day, the president, new president, President Trump, uh, reneged on that uh, agreement uh, was less about trade, perhaps, and much more about what the world would look like with America disengaging and America abandoning its uh, critically important defense of uh, collaborative regional and global system. Um, this, I think it's borne out by the uh, really impressive activism of Abe, not limited to the trade and the economic sphere, but obviously including that, uh, to not only establish and bolster Japan's stature and role on the international stage, but more importantly, to try to hold together a rules-based order. And I think he's understood TPP as a manifestation of the principle that we needed to modernize the rules that we lived by. We needed to abide by the rules that we uh, adopted. And we needed to set high standards that would, rather than ostracize and isolate a country like China, would give it something to aspire to, along with some incentives to get there. But again, um, Wendy can speak volumes to the, the, the transition uh, to CPTPP and, and what was involved in that. So, Wendy, I should tell, uh, again, our um, viewing audience and listening audience that uh, you're America's lead negotiator on the TPP. And so um, I'm sure uh, you uh, had some feelings, too, when it went um, up in smoke, uh, when President Trump took out his very large felt pen. It seemed that he could only ever write in letters that big, but even I could read Donald Trump across the, uh, the rescindment order. So, but reflecting on Shinzo Abe, um, he, as an external observer, he didn't just take it lying down. He thought, how do I rebirth this? So uh, ref your reflections on the death of TPP and the birth of CPTPP. So definitely a feeling of shock and I'd say despair. And right after Trump um, exited the U.S. or withdrew the U.S. from TPP, Shinzo Abe said something along the lines of TPP is going to be meaningless without the United States. And so I think a number of us just thought this was just going to die. But he did give up. And I think he, as he thought this through more, I think he really thought he could convince Donald Trump to return to, C to TPP. And I think Danny can attest to all the times that this was raised by Abe um, with, um, with um, the American presidents about getting back into TPP. And I think he also recognized that um, in talking to the other CPTPP countries, that he that he could work with them to you know bring a new version into effect. What was so impressive about um, that turnaround is that Japan really showed leadership, particularly in an area where, frankly, in their posture in most trade negotiations up until that time, had been very defensive, not offensive. So he took a leadership role and he, um, you know, he was able also to make sure and keep most of the agreement intact, recognizing that if Japan started pulling things off the table, others would and the agreement would unravel. And that wasn't mm -hmm. in his interest. So I think it was remarkable that as he led the renegotiation of TPP and brought CPTPP into place, that he did not um, bow to agriculture pressure to take some of the agriculture concessions off the table. He left them in the agreement, but offered them to the other 10 countries, not to the United States. Now, ultimately, Trump got him back to the negotiating table um, and in the threat with the threat of auto tariffs, I think Abe had no choice but to provide mark, agriculture market access to the United States. But again, you know, watching this saga 
um, and how Abe did turn this around, particularly from his initial comments about, you know, I would call some of being in despair about TPP. It, it's quite, quite an achievement. And I would say an important part of his legacy as we reflect on it um, in, through, in this event. Well, thank you uh, for that. Takako, um, we're about halfway through our time together uh, in this um, uh, wider reflection on uh, Shinzo Abe's life and career and legacy. But to change our focus now to foreign security policy, um, uh, let me pose this question to you. Um, I wrote just uh, literally yesterday in The Economist magazine that uh, China and the rise of China was very much the organizing principle for much uh, of uh, Shinzo Abe's international policy. Um, as um, Danny said before, the TPP was strategic policy as much as it was economic policy. But then, of course, we have uh, the major changes he brought about to the machinery of bureaucratic machinery of Japanese national security policy. Uh, you had, of course, uh, the change, the legislation which changed the interpretation of Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. Uh, his commitment um, in uh, terms of greater expenditure on, um, on military hardware and his other legislative initiatives which opened for the first time the possibility, albeit under restricted circumstances, for collective security action. So, as, again, as uh, an ill-informed gaijin looking at all this stuff, he strikes me as remarkably transformative of Japanese foreign security policy against most of the post-war measures. But I'd really, because this is your area of expertise, Takako, I really value your uh, reflections on that. Um, thank you, Kevin. I think what you said about the machinery part is the less understood, that I think he not only transformed policy, but also the process in which decisions are made. Um, and I think there has been quite a few interviews that he's given over the past year. And what strikes me is that he really didn't take the US-Japan alliance for granted. And that, that was because of what he thought about China, as you say, um, and that um, and that. It, but at the same time, it wasn't just about the US-Japan alliance, but he actually played the strategic game in a way of, as you mentioned, we're trying to reach out to Vladimir Putin, and also with China, it's really uh, right before COVID, there was talk of possibly a visit or there was something that he was trying to do that might be not what people usually think of him. Um, also, the other thing is the Quad and, the, of course, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. But I, I was really struck by um, the recollection and the message by, um, uh, from um, India um, after his passing. And I think this all shows that his vision, although people would tend to focus on the U.S.-Japan alliance part with the Trump part, that he was trying to do was a little was a lot greater and that that part tends to be overlooked when we look at his legacy of what he tried to do on a foreign a policy scene. And also, as you mentioned, in terms of machinery, it was not just the policy, but the process. And that part, since I think we're at this point looking back and thinking, is it really that he transformed the process completely or was it really driven by his personal drive? And that's something that we have to see in Japan as things unfold going forward, because he did leave us with a lot of things that he wanted to do. And I'm sure that he would have wanted to see it through, but he unfortunately could not. So we have to see what happens with what he tried to do. If you were to give our viewing audience a simple 60 seconds on the before and after of uh, his reforms to the process of Japanese national security policy decision-making, I think that'd be useful for our audience. Yes. So Japan always had um, something called the National Security Council, but it didn't really have a uh, a substantial secretariat that came with. And he being a prime minister, um, although this happened alongside other reforms that centralized power within the prime minister's office, still, especially on the security side, which came later than other issues, the fact that there is a pretty robust national security secretariat that um, has people coming all from the foreign ministry, um, defense ministry, and including self-defense force officer, the uniform personnel is very different that um, the prime minister has his own brain trust with him in engaging security policy, and they meet a lot more regularly than before. And these are the mechanics that he set in place as prime minister. And I think that had worked well 
both in terms of Japan's crisis management, and we will be seeing what the results of that will be in terms of Japan's defense planning, because we are having major decisions happening this year with the redrafting of the national security strategy and the national defense strategy and the defense planning. So we'll see how the process um, works out this time too. But I think that's something that we think is more institutionalized than that, that that will be one of his legacies to bring in these kind of mechanics to Japan's security system. Erika, you're a former foreign minister of Japan. Um, how central was the uh, rise of China as an organizing principle to Shinzo Abe's foreign security policy? Um, well, the answer is, of course, that is a major issue that promoted the change in the Japanese in Japanese foreign policy. But um, his this the line of thinking has been. It's not that he changed the course of our foreign policy. Japan's foreign policy has been, in my mind, always built around um, the idea of how we could deter foreign risk, com risks coming to the Jap to Japanese peace and stability from foreign countries, um, Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and now um, DPRK, and also China. So the we had uh, we place importance to alliance with the United States. And the US is the only one country we call an ally. That is very important for various reasons, but one of the major reasons is security. Carbon uh, spoke relationship that Asian countries have, has had with the United States. But so the risk has changed and China is one of the major ones. But um, so, but I think in my mind, Prime Minister Abe was pursuing the same policy, international policy, which former foreign, foreign uh, prime ministers were pursuing. It's just that they could not get things accomplished. Prime Minister Abe has had enough political capital to get things done. That's the major difference. It's not that there is a quality tape. I mean, the, the difference is in quality. It's just that ability to implement. And he, in that sense, he elevated Japanese foreign policy to meet the existing risks that we perceive as risks. Thank you so much. Danny, um, you're a seasoned observer of the evolution of Japanese foreign security policy. Um, again, your reflections on the China factor, obviously. Um, secondly, how deeply transformative uh, has uh, the Abe period been in terms of uh, the uh, direction and substance of Japanese foreign security policy? And finally, something which I think uh, Takako touched on before, uh, which is um, the important point that he was not simply a monochrome uh, foreign policy actor. He constantly had his uh, vision cast wider in two senses. The Quad, obviously the India relationship, uh, to a lesser extent the Australia relationship. Um, but secondly, uh, frankly, a more nuanced approach to trying to manage tensions down, at least with Putin's Russia, uh, but also in those efforts during the um, period of 1920, uh, 2019-2020 of securing a uh, return bilateral from Xi Jinping uh, to, um, uh, to Tokyo after his own bilateral, which effectively unfroze the relationship from that period going back to the nationalisation of uh, Sankoku um, back in, from memory, 2012. Um, so um, your reflections on those points, uh, Danny? Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think, without a doubt, the rise of China was a huge uh, influencer in obvious thinking and his policies uh, was certainly uh, one of, if not the organizing principle. I think another organizing principle, however, was a deep conviction that the 
U.S.-led post-war, what he called the rules-based order, this concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, was not a theoretical objective, that this was the world that uh, he wanted to live in and he wanted to help to defend. Abe f frequently said, I remember him talking about uh, Japan's neighborhood and the geography. And I think that um, because of the long history of Japan had with uh, difficult neighbors, China, Russia, uh, Korea, uh, but also um, because of the very clear and present dangers that he saw coming from the uh, unresolved uh, legacy of the war uh, with those neighbors. Um, Abe was really determined to uh, involve and sustain American engagement uh, in the region. And that ironically, one of the drivers uh, behind his incredible activism as prime minister, remember, he made an astonishing 80 some odd trips abroad as, as prime minister. He engaged very actively in a whole host of multilateral activities. And as you mentioned, really helped to invent some like uh, the Quad. Um, this had to do, I'm sorry to say, with a certain skepticism on his part as to whether America was really up to the task, as, as to whether America was really going to be there in the decisive way that it had been in the past and was able to contend effectively uh, with these uh, challenges from uh, China in the first instance, North Korea and uh, Russia as well. Uh, to maintain this kind of uh, rules-based order. So I think the transformation, as both uh, Kawaguchi Sensei and, and Takako have said, um, was not in the direction of uh, Japanese policy, but in the incredible effectiveness with which he wielded the, the mechanics of uh, government the, the effective way in which he presented a real uh, image and vision. He put a face on Japan for the world after a blur of relatively faceless prime ministers. Uh, and he stood for something nationally, regionally, and globally. And I think that uh, mm. that represents a transformative uh, element in Japan's history. Hmm. I know Wendy has to leave us soon, so I'm just going to leave one question with her before um, she uh, she goes, and we'll can sustain this in uh, in your absence, Wendy. Which is um, his efforts to reform the Japanese economy domestically, um, and also Abenomics. Uh, it generated its own noun, and then we had associated with that womenomics uh, on uh, Japanese social policy. Uh, both of these questions are of, uh, of interest to you and your work with us at the Asia Society. Quick reflections on how far he got on both those questions. And then I'll flip the same questions to uh, Yoriko once you've gone. Wendy. I think, you know, in both of those areas, I think he had the right objectives, um, but I would kind of give him an incomplete, unfortunately. I think um, Abenomics had, you know, the three arrows on monetary policy, a bit more successful, fiscal, stim fiscal policy, less successful, and structural reform. Frankly, I would argue that most of the structural reform came from agriculture reform, which was part of his trade policy. Um, with respect to women, you know, womenomics, um, he, look, he put the issue on the table. Um, he promoted women. He, he, he was responsible for getting legislation through on child care and other, you know, mechanisms to make it easier for women in, you know, in the workplace. Um, but Japan still faces huge challenges um, in, in that space, particularly with respect to um, senior level Japanese women showing up in the boardroom um, and, you know, in the government, in the cabinet, et cetera. 
But again, people are talking about womenomics um, and, um, you know, in, improvements were made just a lot further to go. And so hopefully, um, you know, that legacy will continue. It'll be something that Prime Minister Kishida um, will also put an emphasis on, particularly given the demographic crisis in Japan. You need more women in the workplace. They can help. <laughs> Absolutely, Wendy, uh, and um, and thank you for being with us uh, for this discussion. Yoriko, taking up the themes which um, yes. Wendy's just read on the yes. economy and the role of women in the Japanese economy and, frankly, in society as well, mm -hmm. because they're both linked, and I'll come to uh, Takako after you. Your reflections on that, you're both um, successful Japanese women in a society which mm -hmm. um, uh, Australian men like me would even say is a pretty solidly male-dominated society, which is, uh, mm -hmm. which is bad. So um, your reflections on that, Yoriko? Yes. Well, I agree with what Wendy just said about um, his accomplishment in these areas. Um, he, he, was, he had good intentions, good policies, but there uh, he did not, he was not able to uh, accomplish as much as he did in political, in foreign policy areas. Um, the major reform of the Japanese economy, the third arrow of the economics uh, is being, um, is in the process. Um, it's an accomplished job for Prime Minister Abe. Women uh, women, he was really interested and enthusiastic. I remember the one um, conference that he initiated, which is called WOW, W-O-W, in which uh, Japan invited many um, leadership women from all the countries outside Japan, including African leaders, female African leaders, and um, there was a, um, there are many sessions. And Prime Minister, I was attending one, one of the uh, sessions. Prime Minister Abe himself came to the meeting, spending a um, whole afternoon attending, listening, and asking questions, discussing. This is an extra extraordinary act for a busy Prime Minister. He was very eager. He wanted to push. He wanted to uh, increase women, female participation in the senior level, working level. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Takako, I think what both Yoriko and Wendy are saying, um, he's placed on the agenda, but a huge uh, distance still to travel. Um, give me a sense of how far you think he pushed the dial. Right. And what must now happen under Kishida-san in order to take this to a whole new reality? Over to you. Right. Um, just to pick up on the woman's side of things, I think um, it was interesting that uh, Mr. Abe had the political capital, and I think he knew his place um, in the sense that he represented or he had strong support on the conservative wing of the, his party. So he knew that he was sort of the unlikely but maybe effective that he will less, feel he face less criticism from the right when he promotes these type of policies, whether it's women or maybe even foreign workers. So I think that he was, was effective in being the sort of unlikely advocate. And of course he had his critiques because he was somewhat the unlikely advocate. And I think it's a long way to go. I agree with Wendy that is still an incomplete, but I'm hoping that there is some good news coming out of the fact that we had the record number of women elected to the upper house election this time. And although the number is still small, I think we're on the right track and hopefully it will accelerate a little bit quicker so that things will change just a lot faster. So. And in the Japanese boardrooms, Takako, which, uh, which matters as well, because it affects women being appointed to executive positions and the yes. whole broader phenomenon of getting women into the workforce. What's your, what are your views there? Um, unfortunately, I've been always in academia, so that's an area I'm not that familiar with, but I do see new um, friends becoming board members, and I think that's a new trend that I'm hoping that will accelerate so that my good female friends will be represented more in the corporate area as well. We've got about 10 minutes to go, and I was going to wrap up with a couple of themes which uh, each of you have touched on so far, but I think it's worthwhile exploring further. 
Um, uh, one is, um, uh, Yoriko mentioned this before, that uh, uh, Shinzo Abe was a nationalist. And of course, this created controversy um, uh, in countries um, around Japan, uh, most particularly in the Republic of Korea. If you would try to give me a sense, um, each of you, of trying to define Shinzo Abe's notion of patriotism and nationalism, uh, how would you describe it to an international audience in a way which would make sense? I think what was on his mind, Shinzo's mind, was peace and stability and mm. prosperity of Japan. He was, um, he ha- he was politically, he, um, he was a conservative but not narrow-minded, as I said, nationalist. He was an idealist and at the same time a realist. I remember he visited Yasukuni Shrine. And then after uh, many things going on between Japan and China, he stopped visiting Yasukuni. Mm. I think he went twice, but did not later on. That shows his realistic um, side of his political behavior. Um, he, he was thinking of the situation in a very strategic way, whether uh, what he, his policy will serve the purpose he wanted to achieve, which is peace. And he, that really explains his behavior mm. in my mind. Thank you. Danny, your reflections on that before I go to Takaku. I couldn't agree more with uh, Kawaguchi Sensei. The, uh, the essence of Shinzo Abe, in my view, is a mix of ideological nationalists on the one hand and uh, consummate uh, pragmatist on the other. Um, He balanced his approach to China, for example, uh, with, say, a carrot and a stick. Uh, He did actively court uh, Xi Jinping, as you, Kevin, alluded to, as well as uh, making uh, what most people consider to be uh, uh, an ill-fated effort to persuade Vladimir Putin to negotiate the status of the Northern Territories. he traveled to North Korea. He attempted uh, both reasoning and sanctions uh, in an effort to deal with both the nuclear problem and the issue of the abductees. Uh, and he, whether you like it or not, um, he navigated the very abrupt transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, always mindful of where Japan's national interests lie. And he uh, went to great lengths, uh, even some would argue uh, uh, embarrassing himself in an effort to try to sustain uh, strong ties and, and with the United States and strong US engagement uh, with Japan and in the region. Uh, so his motto when he ran in 2012 was beautiful Japan. And I think that reflected not just a political slogan for domestic uh, consumption, uh, but uh, a, a form of loyalty to the nation and the culture, uh, very mindful of its long history uh, that spurred his efforts to ensure that uh, Japan would act as and be seen as a world leader and a major contributor. Um, a word from you, um, Takako, on this one, and I've got one final question to ask about um, what Danny has just touched upon, which is uh, uh, Shinzo Abe's leadership on Uh, let's call it the liberal democratic world at a time when there were questions about whether America wished to remain as leader. But just before we do that, any a minute or two from you on uh, understanding for an international audience uh, Shinzo Abe's nationalism, Yasukuni and the rest? 
Um, yes. Um, I think what he was for Japan is best described in the headline of an um, article in The Economist, which called him the champion of Japan. And I think he, people might have disagreed with what kind of vision he might have had as what kind of champion Japan might be, but people had no doubts that he was a strong, determined, and devoted leader. And as you say, I think people are appreciative of the fact that they're seeing now that he seemed to have been a respected leader around the world. And um, yeah, so that's how I like describe his nationalism um, in a different way. Just to conclude, um, Danny raised a fascinating point before, um, and it's something, again, I've reflected on indirectly in what I've written in The Economist myself, which is when there are grave doubts on the part of many of us who are allies of the United States as to where the Trump administration was actually going and whether it was fundamentally changing the face of American, not just domestic politics, but America's um, post-war obligations to its treaty allies and its whole notion of um, international and global leadership. Uh, and we all, uh, as intelligent observers of these events, saw one case after another of Trump um, cuddling up to North Korean dictators and then giving his traditional allies in Japan and the Republic of Korea and in Europe a, a hard time and threatening to withdraw troops and God knows whatever else. So what fascinated me about um, Japan in this period under Shinzo Abe, uh, Danny, was his, um, it's almost a, an internal resolve to try and keep the band together <laughs> while the Americans are out to lunch um, uh, on the, uh, under periods of the, uh, of the Trump administration. I saw this, for example, in the way in which he managed his diplomacy with both uh, Delhi and Canberra. I saw it in terms of his diplomacy in Europe, um, his diplomacy even with partners at the UN. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Germans and others and the Indians, sort of, uh, I think, got the script, but he would have been, frankly, preeminent uh, in, I uh, use my term advisedly, holding the foreign policy and security band of the liberal democratic world together while America sorted itself out. Your reflections on that one, Danny, as we draw this discussion to a close. I think you put your finger on it, and it tracks uh, neatly with the points that uh, Kawish Sensei and Wendy made about TPP and the transition to CPTPP. Um, you touched on something very important, Kevin, which is that Abe was not exclusively focused on the Asia-Pacific, although he invested very heavily in building a strong relationship with Australia, as you mentioned, New Zealand, um, with uh, India, and very importantly, and he really did a tremendous amount to sort of draw uh, India into the fold, uh, but with the Pacific Islands as well, and importantly with ASEAN. He was tremendously active at a time when the U.S. was missing in action. But it didn't stop in the Indo-Pacific because his engagement with the U.K., his engagement with the EU, his engagement with Africa in the TCAD, his engagement through the G7, through the G20, and in various U.N. Uh, formats really propelled Japan into a uh, position of constructive influence in support of uh, these principles of mutual respect, of collaboration, of making common cause. And as you noted, and I referred to earlier, um, he did a magnificent job of creating what's really a kind of league of like-minded middle powers that have done a great deal to not only hold the United States uh, in the global network as an active member, but also to hold that network together uh, independently of the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, your any reflections on what I've just said and Danny's? Yes, I want to say that um, Japan-US relationship alliance is the most important pillar of our foreign policy. And the alliance needs to be cultivated always. So what that, that was what Shinzo Abe was doing. And that also means that we will be, we should be 
helping going along with the U.S. to have the kind of world that we want, we want to have, that is rule of law, freedom, democracy, and all that. So that's what he was doing. So, Takako, the, the last word goes to you, my friend. Um, uh, Abe, the, uh, the bridge builder and the band holder together of, um, and there's a Ford reference here, Trump comes back, an isolationist America returns in the future under a non-Trump but Trump-like presidency. Um, uh, this critical role of uh, holding the liberal democratic world together. Um, your reflections on that as we close our discussion today. Yes, I think the sense of that is very strong now, um, right now, especially given Ukraine. And that Japan feels that there is something to be said about Japan being in the liberal and democratic part, but without trying to waive the democracy part too much. Um, it, Prime Minister Kishida has been active in dealing with countries, not just with NATO, but also countries that will align with Japan if we talk about unilateral um, um, change of the status quo by force is bad. So I think Japan's going to try to not to work with NATO, work with other liberal democratic allies, but also be mindful of the fact that Asian countries might have different interests in this and trying to hold the band together, but not just exclusively with other so-called Western countries and trying to play a role in a different way possibly. And I think that's something that's very important going forward for Japan. Yes, I look forward to the, to, for the day when um, our friends in Europe and our friends in the United States stop simply using the term the West as if it's co-definitional with uh, the liberal democratic world. Right. Um, uh, it is a much wider and more inclusive concept, which a 15 second reflection on the composition of the quad uh, should cause people to reach a different conclusion. Um, Yarko Kawaguchi, thank you for your service uh, as foreign minister of Japan and uh, as a dear friend of the Asia Society and for joining us in this important conversation today about uh, your uh, former colleague and um, prime minister of Japan, uh, Shinzo Abe. Um, Danny Russell, um, thank you for uh, your uh, reflections, wise as ever and uh, knowledgeable of Japan as ever. And Takako, given your particular focus uh, in Tokyo on the national security machinery of the Japanese government, um, thank you for your observations as well and Wendy in her absence. I'll just conclude by saying this. Um, politicians come and go, uh, and I've been one that's come and gone. Um, but there is... Um, an interesting um, reflection on, on Abe-san, uh, which is the world was not just shocked by the act of violence. The world was deeply shocked that this was an act of violence against a man who had moved the dial on so many different fronts um, so that the face of Japanese politics, but Jap Japan's profile in the world had changed because of his period in office. And I think all of us would say had changed for the better. And so with those concluding remarks, um, on behalf of us all and on behalf of the Asia Society's global family, uh, we honour uh, Shinzo Abe's life and career. And if I could say on behalf of us all, the world and not just Japan is poorer for his passing. My name's Kevin Rudd. Thank you for joining us uh, in this uh, important uh, webinar from the Asia Society as we join you from our network around the world. Uh, reflecting on the life and times and passing of this extraordinary man, Shinzo Abe. Thank you all.